Double Features, I was his favorite, it was Cagney. But despite the harmony on the set, the producers made sure that the Wonder Years reflected the ups and downs faced by most families every day. Kevin, Wayne, I told you to knock it off! The family itself was so interesting to me because it was not a perfect family. It was a loving family, but at the same time, the father was incommunicative and gruff. The mother was sort of off and a little spacey at times. Uh, the big brother used to, you know, pummel the little brother. Kevin's growing pains were usually mined for comedy, but they also led to some of the show's most affecting episodes. There was just one wonderful episode where, where his father takes him to work with him, and he looks up to his father because his father is sort of a, a low-level executive job. I'll never forget how I felt at that moment. I felt that my father was a great man. Arnold, this is incompetence, just plain incompetence. Look, Al Wysanski's a little... No, crazy. never mind Wysanski. He works for you. Now, this is the third major screw-up in your department the last two... And his father is royally chewed out by his boss in front of Kevin. But in no way does Kevin look down on his father because of this. And uh, I never forget that the scene where they both come home. And the father walks in, he's angry as heck. Then the door opens again and Kevin walks in, and he's angry as heck. He's become like a reflection of his father. And the respect is, is still there. I'm starting here, I go tearing up again. It was just an incredible episode, great television. The Wonder Years' brief first season was a resounding success. And ABC took the unusual step of renewing it for three more years. And in September of 1988, the show surprised everyone in the television world when it won the Emmy Award for Best Comedy Series, beating out such established hits as Cheers and The Golden Girls. It was really, really exciting because we all went up as a family and there was no question that it was just going to be one person. We were all going to go up and, and get the award. But the cast and crew's joy was short-lived. They were soon shocked by an unexpected decision and wondered if the show could survive a major creative change that was just around the corner. The Wonder Years began its second season as a critical darling with a devoted following. But halfway through that year, the series faced its first major crisis when creators Neil Marlins and Carol Black abruptly announced they were leaving for personal reasons that the intensely private couple kept to themselves. When I heard they were leaving, I was devastated and freaked because I was sure that was, you know, was going to be it. Marlins and Black turned their creation over to writer and producer Bob Brush. The pair had been the show's main writers, so now Brush had no scripts and no time to catch up. It was a big responsibility. This was a, really a quite wonderful show, and we had a big changeover of staff. And uh, that's when I brought over Ken Topolsky to line produce the show, who was a tremendous support. I um, met Bob for br breakfast. He said, look, I need a producer, and I've got no scripts. Are you interested? I said, how bad is it? He goes, it's horrible. I said, great, sign me up. As he took charge of the show's scripts, Brush continued the storyline that dealt with Kevin's on-again, off-again romance with Winnie Cooper. There's no reason I can't talk to Winnie. We're still friends. All I have to do is go up to her and say, Winnie? Uh, uh, the way that... Winnie Cooper was portrayed was always from a distance. You know, even when Kevin and Winnie were close, Winnie was still this unknown entity. There's always this air of mystery and, and like, who is that person? And what's going on? Well, did you show it to anybody? Show what? Well, the yearbook. You know what I wrote? Oh. You know, you can just forget about it, okay? Because I didn't mean a word of it. And you can just rip out the page and throw it in the garbage because... Now, don't be shy. Grab your lady and pass on by. First love could be a grueling, nerve-wracking ordeal. Action, girls go. Not unlike planning a TV production around child actors. Minors could only be on the set for nine and a half hours each day, and much of that time was taken up with mandatory schooling sessions, recreation breaks, and meals. The biggest thing that affected the schedule certainly were working with minors, and particularly one that was in every scene. Every minute.
it's accounted for. So you go to the bathroom and like there'd be someone like, okay, he's in the bathroom for like, you know, 45 seconds or three minutes if I had a lot to eat. As a kid, you know, you want to goof off. You'd always try and escape and dodge. You have little hiding places around the stage. You could kind of get away from people, you know. Even with the scheduling constraints, the producers made a point of giving the kids something resembling a normal childhood. Hi, Mike. Nice to meet you. We had a basketball court, uh, the pit, which was an old uh, storage pit, and all the crew guys used to come out and play with us. Bob Brush and Ken Topolsky, they would get really mad at me. But I said, we got to play. This is a boy. So I did things like, once I put peas in my nose, and when it was on his close-up, I went with the peas into my Coke. And we ended up doing stuff like that a lot off camera. If it was somebody else's close-up, we'd try to crack them up. Although life behind the scenes revolved around the young actors, the show itself often tackled serious adult themes, including problems in the Arnold marriage. Where are you going? You better get your Pepsi while it's still fresh on my mind. Dan and Allie were, had this huge scene where they had to fight in the kitchen. Don't bother. I'll get it. No, that's okay, Jack. I'll get it. I said I'll get it. <laughs> Don't break it! I'm not gonna break it, Norma. Well, just because you hate my pottery is no reason Dan and mad. Allie were terrific, just great performances. And then we shot Fred out there listening, and he was doing his beautiful face. I mean, and it's such a hard thing to just sit there and listen. This family needs Pepsi! He was so brilliant at that. Ended up playing the whole thing on Fred, actually. Jack, you should listen to yourself. I want my Pepsi. I want my cup. You sound like an infant. Don't you ever, ever speak to me in that tone of voice. I'll speak the way I want. Fine. Don't expect me to listen to it. This is a comedy that didn't always have to be funny to be good. You could be watching and not necessarily laughing, but responding on an emotional level. Throughout the second and third seasons, the character of Kevin Arnold continued to face the perils of adolescence. They seem awfully roomy in the crotch. Gee, Mom, could you say it a little louder? I'm not sure everyone in the store heard. Attention shoppers, attention shoppers. Plenty of room in Kevin Arnold's crotch. He also had to confront the hard facts of life. Mr. Collins? Mr. Arnold? There were these three episodes about Mr. Kevin and this math teacher everyone hopefully you're fortunate to have found one teacher that really spoke to you that really meant something to you and this was kevin's the lowest common denominator every day after school mr time. collins and i met to accomplish the improbable what law do we apply the commutative law not in this case the community but it wasn't all hard work there was something more it was the man himself i liked him I was getting to know him, and he was getting to know me. Um, Mr. Collins passed away this morning. I was around the same time my grandfather passed away, you know, recently. And, you know, it just was very special to me. I mean, it just, I guess I brought my own personal, you know, stuff to, to making that episode of, um, you know, someone who really, you know, this person who meant a lot to you, who, who you lose. You don't have to believe it. It's an A. Mr. Arnold. Good job, Mr. Collins. <laughs>